Okay, I am going to re-record module 37. Um, I think what's going on is now I can only record two videos back to back before the application doesn't uh, record anymore. It has to be closed down and restarted. So we're going to go ahead and go back to the beginning of module 37. It says transforming the graph of a natural exponential function. And it says natural exponential. Okay, so we've done exponentials before. Where we had 2 to the power x, 3 to the power x, negative 1 half to the power x, such and such, right? But now we're using the natural number. What is the natural number? The natural number is e. Okay, so that means this time the base will be e. And what is e? e just like pi is a number it's 2.718 dot, dot dot it just keeps going on and on and on forever and doesn't have a real pattern of repetition so um, that's going to be our base from now on so it says below is the graph of y equals e to the x now notice they all still have that same point zero one because when I plug in zero into this function, any base to the power zero, no matter what that base is, is going to be one. So they all share all exponentials, whether it's a, a whole number or fraction or e, they all share the same point zero one, okay? And then they all do this, or if it's a fraction exponent, it'll go the other way, right? Um, but let's see how we're going to transform it. So we have to remember our rules for transforming. We have to do these in order in order to ensure that our graph is going to be in the correct position. So you translate horizontally, which means you move left or right um, first, okay? Then you reflect when you flip things over, right? And then you translate vertically, so you shift up or down. You have to do them in that order in order to ensure that it's in the right position. So the first thing that we're going to do is look at this, and the exponent is where the x is, and since I've added 2 to it, that means I'm going to be going left 2 units. Then I'm looking in the front to see if there's a reflection. There's no reflection in this particular problem. And then there's a plus 4, so that means that the, um, excuse me, that the 4 will make it go up 4 units. So if you go in Alex, um, you remember that that plus four also shifts the asymptote. So your asymptote was originally at zero, but now the whole thing's gonna go up four units. So now that asymptote should be at four. And if I take this point, I need to move it to the left two. So now it should be at negative two, one. And then I need to move it up four, so now it should be at negative two, five, okay? And I did an extra point just in case, so if I plug in um, one, I get E, right? And then I minus the points from each other, so that's the points here, one comma E, or one comma 2.7, blah, blah, blah. So we took the point, um, the X value, and subtracted two to shift it to the left, E stayed the same, but the X value turned into negative one. There was no reflection, so we didn't have to change the signs of the Y values. And then when we were at moving it up four, that means we had to add four to our Y values. So we added four to the one here, we got five, we added four to the 2.7 something something, and we ended up with 6.7 something something. This was just to help me visually graph it. However, in Alex, all you're doing is a matter of grabbing and moving, okay? So let's see the next problem. Here we do still have something happening up there. So there is going to be a left shift. So we're shifting to the left, four units. There is a negative in front, so it will reflect over the x-axis, but you don't have a vertical shift. So the horizontal asymptote is not going to move because you did not add or subtract a number outside here. So the asymptote stays put, this spot is going to shift to the left four and then it's going to reflect over the x-axis. So instead of it being over here at negative four and one, it's going to be down at four and negative one. And that's the end of that problem. Now, 
over here, they want us to graph the exponential function and its asymptote. So you simply need two points and the asymptote. Now remember, the asymptote is always at zero on top of the x-axis unless you have a shift, right? And since here I have a shift of minus one, that means the asymptote is gonna go downward one. So that's why the asymptote exists here. Then if you need two points, just plug in numbers. Now, how do you choose which numbers to pick? Always start with whatever is going to make this exponent zero, and then just go one up, okay, or one to the right. So for here, the number that would make x minus four equal to zero is if x equals four, because four minus four is zero. So we chose that x value four, and then we picked one more after it, which would have been five. So here's four, you pick one more to the right and you get five. So when we plugged in four, we got this expression and it gave us a nice fraction. So that was what we typed in Alex. And then it plots your point right here. Then we plugged in five, but we couldn't simplify that any further than this. Um, so in Alex, this is what you're going to type in for your point so that it puts it exactly where it should be. But in our calculator, we need to use it with the exponent. We need to put this in the calc in order to get that decimal, okay? But you don't write the exponent of one when you're typing it in Alex. So once we knew where that decimal, when I knew where the decimal was, I could figure out where to put the dot. In Alex, when you type this in there, they'll know where to put the dot. Once you have the two dots and the asymptote, you just hit the graph button and it'll draw the, the, the graph for you. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here's another example. So what would make this exponent equal to zero? It would be a negative two. Here's negative two. The number to the right would be negative one. So those are the two x values we chose. When we plug them in for negative two, we ended up with the answer five. And for one, we ended up with 4e plus one. But again, we have to use the origin in the calculator in order to get the decimal. But in Alex, you're gonna type in 4e plus one. And so I plotted the two points there, and then I drew the graph. Now notice that here you do have a shift. So the asymptote is not going to be at zero. It has to shift up one. Now this topic using a calculator to evaluate exponential functions. You simply use your power button. So if I go in here, we'll do 3.8, use our power button, and then type in the 11 power, and you get the response. And then it says round it to the nearest thousandth. Here, type it in exactly the way it is, parentheses, fraction, three over four, go to the side, close the parentheses, power button, negative 0 0.95. What's in your calculator should look exactly like what's on your paper. And hit enter, and you get that value, but make sure you round it to the nearest thousandth. Now the next problem says, evaluating an exponential function that models a real world situation. So it says the radioactive substance cesium-137 has a half-life of 30 years. The amount a of t in grams is a sample of c of c blah, blah, blah. the amount a of t in grams of a sample of cesium-137 remaining after t years is given by the following function a of t which is the amount equals 725 one half raised to the t over 30 where the t is years find the initial amount in the sample and the amount remaining after 100 years round to the nearest gram so initial amount means what did you start with before time started, which means that your time would equal zero. So we simply plug in zero, type this whole expression in our calculator exactly the way it is, and we get the value 725. Then to find out the amount remaining after 100 years, you need to plug in 100 for t. So we plugged in 100 for t here, wrote this whole expression in our calculator, and we ended up with a decimal value that had to be rounded. Um, let's go ahead and do that real quick just so you can see. See, we ended up with 
nine to nine. And this is gonna make this whole number um, go up. So it became 72 grams. Okay, the next topic, I've only got, I think these three more topics, yep. So it says using a calculator to evaluate exponential expressions involving base E. So then now you're going to use your E button. So if I clear this out, I'm gonna type 215 and then the E button is right here. So you type E and then you go 0 0.55 and round that to the nearest thousandths, tenths, hundredths, thousandths. The three does not affect the nine. So this is the answer. Then the other one, you would just hit the E button and then type in negative 0 0.3 and you get this value once you round it to the nearest um, thousand. Okay. Evaluating an exponential function at the base E that models a real world situation. So the number of milligrams D of H of a drug in a patient's bloodstream H hours after the drug is injected is modeled by the following function. D of H, which is the milligrams, and 25 E to the negative 0 0.55 H, which is hours. Find the amount of the drug in the bloodstream after three hours and after six hours, round to the nearest hundredth. So the H is the hours. So the H is what becomes three and then later becomes six. And when you type this in your calculator and you round, you end up with 4.80. And you type this in your calculator and round, you end up with 0 0.92. I would practice that to make sure that you, in your calculator, to make sure you end up with these same values. <clears throat> Excuse me. Last topic here. So introduction to compound interest. Suppose Linda places $6,000 in an account that pays 3% interest compounded each year. Assume no withdrawals are made from the account. Do not round. Find the amount in the account at the end of one year. So how do we find interest? Interest is found by taking your principal, which is basically your initial amount. So whether it's how much you borrow or how much you invest or how much you save, this is always gonna be the initial amount. You just can't use another I because you already have I here for interest, okay? But this is your initial amount. And then you have R for rate and T for time. R is usually, is, needs to be in um, decimal form. Okay. So for us, interest equals $6,000 because that's what she put into the account. 3% is the same as 0 0.03. If you're not sure how to convert a percentage to a decimal, your calculator will do it. Type 3 and the percent symbol is in blue above the division symbol. So hit second and then the division symbol and you get the expression 3%. If I hit enter, it'll convert it to a decimal for me. So there's my decimal, and then years, well, it's only been one year. So the years would be one. When I multiply this out, I get $180. But the question isn't how much interest does she have after a year? The question is, is how much does she have in her account at the end of one year? Well, of course, she's gonna have the 6,000 that she put in there, but then now she's also gonna have this $180 that she's collected for interest. So now her total is 6,180. Now it says find the amount in the account at the end of two years. Well, remember, this time um, you're not working with just the six thousand because your bank account at the beginning of the year was not just six thousand anymore. It was six thousand one hundred eighty dollars. The rate has not changed; it stays the same, so 0 0.03. But how many years have passed since you've used this amount? Since I've used that amount, only one year has passed. Okay, um, so when we multiply all of this together, we get 185.40. This is money, so I use two decimals. Then now if you take what you started off in the account at the beginning of this year, and you added the interest that you earned at the end of the year, when you combine those together, you will end up with the value six hundred or $6,365.40.